nice tune. I got a nice tune. Can you hear my nose whistling? Because I'm always really conscious I have a nasal whistle, <laughs> especially when I'm this closely mic'd. Um, as James said there, the, my most recent book um, talks about my experience of depression. Um, and I have two novels that were published before that. And the, the two novels, there was actually a gap of 11 years between the two novels. I also work in advertising um, full time. So I try to combine those things and make life generally pretty difficult for myself. Um, but the, that gap in between those two books was because after the first novel, I had a, quite a, a, a serious um, episode of depression. It was really quite a major breakdown. So then the second novel eventually came along and life went along in between. And then um, I experienced numerous um, depressive episodes and I did CBT. And when I got to the end of the CBT, my therapist said to me, you know, you should write a book about this. And I went, Bleh. because I was still doing the self-talk, the negative self-talk. But actually when I started to think about it, um, I thought, you know, this actually could be a useful book. Um, because I think there is an issue uh, with how we think about depression and how we talk about depression. I think we talk about it in a very serious way, in quite a distant medical way, and I don't think that's relevant. Um, so I think we need to talk about depression in a completely different way. We've already just start, started to talk about it, which is brilliant, that's a great start. But how we talk about it, the words we use, I think we need to reframe those a bit. And this is why. Um, I'm going to have. I'm going to ask for some audience participation here, if I may. Um, these words. And I'm going to go on to explain what these words are. Um, but it's kokoro no katsu. So I want everybody to say kokoro no katsu. And once more, on your own. No I love it. I love it. Um, it's a good job you can't see my prompts down here because my first prompter slide says, lady problems. <laughs> um, and that's because I'm starting this with a story about lady problems. Um, whenever I was going for my weekly cognitive behavioral therapy sessions, I told my work colleagues that uh, I, I didn't actually tell them, I just allowed them to think that I was being treated for mysterious lady problems rather than, <laughs> rather than actually say that I was going to have some psychiatric treatment. And this is only a few years ago. Um, and I actually find that really frustrating because my life was really changing because of the CBT. My whole world was changing because I was changing how I thought about the world and that was changing how I felt. And this was really exciting to me to know that my brain was actually being rewired and also, there were so many people that I thought this kind of therapy could help. And I'm not being sarcastic. I'm not being like, we all know somebody who needs therapy. It wasn't that kind of thing. You know, it was about, um, I could see how this thing would benefit so many people. But I could not talk about it. I just could not talk about it. Even though I was bursting, really wanted to, I just couldn't. Um, and I wondered, why is that? Why can't I talk about this? Why don't we talk about this? Uh, because we talk about everything else. You know, we talk about abortion, we talk about boobs, you know, we talk about everything. So why not this particular thing? Why don't we and how can we? Um, and that was one of the reasons that I wrote the memoir, so that we could start to think and talk about depression in a different kind of way. But it hasn't always been the way that it is now. People used to talk about depression, or as it was known before, you know, and it was, it had, there were other terms to, to describe it before. Um, so, for example, there were the, the ancient Greeks, and they thought that everybody's physiology was made up of four humours. So you had um, phlegm, you had blood, you had yellow bile, and you had black bile. So you're, you were made up of these four parts. Everybody was made up of these four parts. And that meant everybody could be affected by black bile. They could be, you know, this black bile could flare up and people would understand because everybody saw their physiology the same way. They accepted it as part of what, what they were physically. Then in the 17th century, there was a guy called Robert Burton. Um, and he 
wrote a book called An Anatomy of Melancholy, and that was published in 1621, and it was a bestseller at the time. So it was widely read, widely discussed, so it was quite a, a kind of accepted, normal thing at that time. And then I think, you know, when it came up to the romantics in the 19th century, and, you know, it was quite obvious there was quite a lot of mental health issues going on with them, but I think maybe at that time people started to associate mental health problems with um, artists and writers and poets, and maybe ordinary people just thought, well, that's not me. I'm just an ordinary person. I don't feel that way. I don't, I don't do what they do. But then as time went on, you know, um, we got to know, like through the 19th century and the 20th century, the world context changed, and we had media that let us know what was happening around the world, so we could see that things were happening around the world. There were wars, terrible wars. People were dying horribly. Maybe we felt, maybe we judged ourselves, and we stopped talking about it. We didn't want to think, we didn't want to bring it up in that context. Maybe we thought we would be seen as selfish or self-indulgent. I don't know the real reason why, but I think that it is a habit. I think it's a habit that we don't talk about it. Um, I've skipped on a few slides. Yes. Um, so at the minute we think that if we bury our heads and we don't think about it, it'll go away, but it won't because it's been around much longer than we have. It's been around longer than Western society. Um, and it says something, I think, about the UK and Ireland that we don't have the kind of language that expresses subtlety of feeling beyond the feelings that we had in childhood. So if you think of other societies around the world, for example in Germany, they have the word Weltschmerz, which means weariness, or not weariness, but sadness for the world. So it's not a, it's not a world weary, I'm fed up with the world, it's sadness at the state of the world, so it's an external feeling. The Germans also have the word Sensucht, which is a sense of longing for something that could have been perfect if only it had happened, but you still long for that thing. So it's quite a nuanced emotion, but it's a real thing you can experience as an adult. Portuguese have a similar word, which is saudade, which is like a sense of nostalgia for something that maybe happened in the past or someone that you miss. So it's a bit like sensukt, but slightly different. And then the Japanese have a word, uh, for the feeling that they get in the spring, whenever the cherry blossom is all in bloom and it's absolutely beautiful and it's shot through with sadness at the same time. So you get that beauty and you get the joy and you get the sadness all at the same time and that's called monono aware. So around the world they have different nuanced words to describe their feelings and we don't have those terms in our own language. And I think that leaves us at a disadvantage when it comes to talking about things like depression. But we should have language for it because we're human uh, and we communicate all day long. But if you think back to the Greeks, you know, they thought a quarter of you was filled with melancholy. So if you think about it, that's like dragging around a leg the whole time filled with depression. So you're dragging around this leg and if it flares up, if it annoys you, if somebody else notices that your leg's playing up, that's okay, because everybody's made up of the same four humours. They all accept that this is, you know, that's okay for you to feel that way. So what actually causes depression? Well, for me, it was, um, it was a prolonged release of stress hormones. I think that's the case for a lot of people. And basically, my synaptic circuits blew. Um, so the, nor you kind of the more sort of normal hormones that keep you balanced and healthy just weren't getting through because it was just had a, a meltdown in there. Um, but we're lucky because we have medication, and that's what helped me at the start. We have medication, we have therapists, we have CBT, who can, you know, those people can help us rejig how we see the world. We've got those two things, but imagine if we had the talkability and the familiarity and the normal normalness normalness um, of melancholy in previous centuries. Imagine if we had all those things. You had the medication and the therapist, and they just kind of this is normal life that this happens. What a difference I think that would make. But as it is, we hide it and we hide from it. Um, for me. It felt, you know, it didn't feel like 
how I assumed depression might feel, which was feeling sad, maybe wasn't that at all. Um, it was the most searing kind of, and the most raw kind of grief that you would feel at the loss of a loved one, but it's directed at nothing in particular. So you're walking around with this mental pain in your head all the time, um, and you can't actually communicate this to anybody because it's not, nothing has caused it. You can't say, you know, so-and-so died and it's awful and I feel awful. You just feel awful. So we don't have the words to actually explain to people that sometimes we feel mental pain. Sometimes the pain can be so great that it's unbearable and then you think, well, the only way to escape this pain is to switch myself off. And that was how I felt uh, whenever I had my major break breakdown. And of course, my husband, God help him, sitting there long-suffering Dave, um, he was rightly so terrified because he didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. We were pretty much helpless. And I do think this is why we need to talk about it and change how we talk about it. And by that I mean how, change how we think about it. Think about it as a whole, part of a whole part of everybody rather than a thing that happens to some people. Um, I think if it was something that we talked about openly, we would recognise it then in other people and we'd have much more empathy for ourselves and for them. We'd have much more compassion. We'd recognise it in other people and be able to step in if maybe they don't recognise it themselves. Um, and would, I would love it if we could just make it normal, part of a normal experience. I think how we do that, actually, is maybe to change how we refer to it. For me, the word depression is a complete misnomer. I think it's rubbish word, rubbish word. Uh, it's, the depression is wet weather. You know what I mean? A depression is a dent in the bed. For me, a better word for it, and it's the word that I use, is mood flu. So you might get flu one year, and then you don't get it for another couple of years, and then you might get it again. But you do recover. It's just a normal thing that happens to your body. So I call it mood flu. But I was really delighted to learn that the Japanese have been thinking the same way. And they, uh, they had one of the highest suicide rates in the world. And um, part of this was due to the fact that they didn't actually have language to explain de depression. They were either normal or in psychosis. But if you're depressed, you're not here, you're not at psychosis stage. Um, so they introduced a new term to talk about depression. And that new term is kokoro no katsu, which is a cold of the soul. And once I introduced that new term, more people understood what it was and could recognise it in themselves and other people. So I think the way we talk about depression, how we talk about it, is that it should hopefully evolve so that we can see it as part of everybody. And now is a good time actually to start, you know, talking about it and thinking about it. Because at this time of the year in the autumn, you know, we're losing light, we're losing warmth, and your own hormones are telling you to wind down and rest. And when you don't get enough rest, then uh, you release stress hormones. And when you release too many stress hormones, then you are at risk of depression. Um, I did actually suggest in work that we work longer hours in the summer and shorter hours in the winter. And they all had a bloody good laugh. Um, and I, I did find it exasperating, not because they had a laugh, but because I'm used to that. Um, but they wouldn't even entertain the idea that A, we're animals, and we are at the mercy of our own hormones, and B, our work is not everything. Yes, we need something to give us purpose, and we need something to put a roof over our heads. Um, but if we drive ourselves into the ground, we will break down. We're not machine parts, we will break down. So I think it's not too rocket science, they have introduced a new term, but it's not a hard one. Um, I don't think there's anything scary about it, I think it's something that we can all develop. It's a new habit, I think people need to get into a new habit, because they've got out of the habit of talking about mental illness, hell, illness, mental health or mental illness. New habits are difficult to take on, people don't like learning new behaviours. Um, because it's painful to do that. To learn anything new is challenging and nobody really enjoys it. But I think it would be worth it um, just for the difference that it would make. So I think the way to start talking about it, if you don't know where to begin and you just want to have a chat about it generally, which I think would be nice, um, I think you just ask people around you, 
do you want to learn some Japanese? And there you have your Japanese phrase. So that's how you start. And that's how I finish. So thank you very much. Thank you.